Well, hello and a warm welcome to this, the first episode of the SEMA Dialogue Series. I'm David Williams. Now, globalization and technological progress are making changes harder to predict and organizations more vulnerable. It's an increasingly interconnected world and organizations must now do more to respond appropriately to risks as well as protect the value that they create. So it's against this backdrop that uh, management accounting has become more relevant than ever. But the practice of management accounting varies across organizations. So with this in mind, the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, or SEMA, alongside the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, have launched a set of global management accounting principles. That's to help organizations across the world ensure that they have substantial and uniform management accounting systems. Now the draft document is currently under a 60-day consultation period and that brings us to today's discussion. With the help of my studio guests we'll be unpacking the draft document and what it means for the management accounting industry. We also have an audience with us and they'll be joining the show a little later. So joining me on the desk now are Noel Tago, who is Executive Director of Education at SEMA, Musa Shabani who is Corporate Executive for Stakeholder Relations at Tongart Hewlett and Kevin Thomas Senior Lecturer and Deputy HOD in the Department of Finance and Investment Management at the University of Johannesburg. Before we get into the nitty-gritty of management accounting, Noel, I think rather than just have a title and a name, let's hear a little bit more about each of our panellists so we know who's talking to us and who we're talking with. Noel, how did you get to this position and what's your background? Um, <clears throat> my name is Noel again. I, I, I'm Executive Director for Education SEMA. Uh, I have moved between academia and uh, practice uh, in my job. So in the past, I'd have worked for uh, British Petroleum, Elf Aquitaine in the oil industry, and KPMG in financial services advisory for in Africa. And in terms of teaching in universities, I've taught at the universities of Dundee, Reading, University College Dublin, Manchester, and latterly Oxford University. And your own academic training? And my own academic training is initially from the University of Ghana, and then the University of Dundee and Oxford University and trained both as a chartered accountant as a chartered and a chartered management accountant. Okay, so that's a considerable experience in teaching and in the corporate world. Musa Shabani uh, of Tongat Hewlett. Yes, I've spent uh, 11 years of my life uh, in Unilever uh, as a management accountant mm. and I have been through um, uh, the process of Unilever moving from uh, merge, merging its, merging its uh, processes in, in South Africa and forming one Unilever uh, company. And after that, I had moved to consulting business uh, mm -hmm. where I was on my own uh, for five years. And thereafter, I moved to Tonga Tulet, which is my current position, where I am a stakeholder relations rep especially focusing on government and, and communities because okay. as a, an institution, a, as a, an organization, it's very important that we create value for those two stakeholders in our land value creation mm. processes. When I saw that you were the stakeholder relations manager, I thought, well, perhaps the management accountants at Tongard who would have sent the stakeholder relations guy, but in fact you are, have been a management accountant as yes. well. So qualified for the job but uh, for this discussion but also having exactly. a broader view. Yes, I am a fellow of the of the institute. Yeah, I have studied through UNISA and then I uh, thereafter and then I started to, uh, studying uh, mm. through SEMA uh, uh, and I'm qualified. Great. Uh, and and then Kevin uh, at the University of Johannesburg. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Finance and Investment Management at the University of Johannesburg. I've um, been there for 10 years now. Um, my role, in addition to lecturing uh, finance uh, and investment management, is that I'm the SEMA advocate for the university, which really means that I'm the liaison person between the university and SEMA for things like accreditation, yeah. um, looking at things of trying to get students employed and employable, and all those kind of things, um, and working closely with SEMA. Well, what strikes me immediately is, first of all, we've got a very well-qualified panel here, but secondly, that there's a lot of work being done already in the field of management accounting. There is an organization. You're the advocate for it. You're a fellow of it. Uh, there's clearly a lot uh, that we've got to work with. But let's start, let's be quite simple, Noel. What is management accounting? And I have to confess, uh, is this uh, accounting for what management gets up to? No, it's, it's, a, it's a branch of the accountancy profession, but yes, it's, 
in itself, it's a very broad term. So let's get our definition here. Okay. <coughs> I'll first uh, define it on itself and contrast it to other parts of accounting to make the meaning quite clear. <coughs> Management accounting just simply seeks to uh, gather information and process the information and communicate the information in order to support, number one, decision making in organizations. And it can be decision making about what has happened in the past and what do we do with it, what is happening now and what we ought to do in the future. And it also helps to support uh, the, uh, what you do in terms of the actions of people. So once you make a decision, people will have to act on the decision. And what management accounting does is to monitor the actions and behaviors and to report the, the uh, outcomes of those behaviors. And it is very much uh, present focus and forward looking uh, in terms of that. If I just contrast it with uh, another branch of accounting which is called financial accounting. What financial accounting uh, seeks to do is also to communicate to various types of people about the financial health and the financial performance of organizations. And so what it does is to focus very much on what if organizations are done in the past and talk to external stakeholders, those who are not part of the internal community of the organization. So typically financial accounting is what we get when companies uh, announce their results. Exactly. And the financial director stands up and goes through. That's goes financial through. accounting. That's financial accounting. But what you've got to know in terms of the difference is that it is speaking mainly to external stakeholders, whereas in management accounting it is speaking to internal stakeholders. Mm. Uh, financial accounting is reporting results. Mm. Uh, so management accounting is trying to influence the results before they are uh, reported. Financial accounting's focus is what has happened in the past. Management accounting's focus is what is happening now and what would happen in the future. So those are some of the mm. uh, differences. I normally use a car analogy for it and to say that you need the two to work complementarily to each other. When you are driving a car, you will find out uh, that if, if you, you run your organization only on the basis of uh, financial accounting, it's like using your rear view mirror to drive the car. You crash. And, and we've seen that in the world. If you complement it with management accounting, then what you're doing is using your windscreen and using other aspects, your, your dashboard and other things to, to operate and to run the organization. So you need the two working hand in hand in order to do that. I think that's a great way of opening it. Now we've got the picture. Now I'm gonna stay with you for one more question and then bring our other panelists in. Uh, what's the problem? Perhaps that's the way to put it. Uh, it sounds to me as if this is very clear, the distinction. Any organization can understand it. You have organizations that, that have been set up to regulate and manage and you're members of them and, and so on. What's the problem? I think the uh, problem is uh, twofold. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I mean the global problem. I'll talk a little yeah. bit about the African yeah. problem. Uh, the global problem is twofold. If you look at uh, the economic crash in the West, it is primarily a failure of three things. One, a failure of governance. Two, a failure of risk management. Three, a failure of performance management within organizations. <coughs> and uh, it is partly because of this kind of failures that you need to protect organizations uh, 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 and uh, their performance uh, in, in, uh, from uh, uh, running down in terms of the way in which uh, most organizations have run down. Mm. And I would argue that management accounting has something to do with that. But if we put that one aside a little bit, uh, when you talk, uh, you look at the global economic environment, it is changing very fast. And uh, in the past, uh, people have said change had happened all the time. There's two different things about change now. The pace of change is fast. And in the past, change is pre was predictable. Now, most change is not predictable. It's so you would have heard the statement, disruptive change, disruptive technologies, and things like that. So it makes it very difficult yeah. to, uh, for managers of organizations to run uh, organizations. And therefore, you, they need every help that is there to enable them to run their organization. And right. that is where uh, management accountants. Let's pause come. there with Noel. Kevin, I'm going to come to you and perhaps another variation of what the problem is. And you've, you're teaching this subject. Uh, you, as you say, you're an advocate for it. So you've got to take a view of what's happening in, in, in companies and, and the world. It always struck me with the word global financial crisis. How did so many clever, experienced, senior, wise, educated people get this so badly wrong? And it strikes me from what Noel's saying is that if you're not talking the same language, it's very easy to get things wrong. 
Okay. Yes, uh, I think that's important. And, and maybe also just to add, it, I think that's where the, the, the thing about management accounting and financial accounting comes in, is that maybe a, a problem with the financial crisis was that uh, management accounting and financial accounting wasn't aligned or, or speaking the, the same language. So I think the, the key thing that Noel brings up about uh, the, the car analogy and that management accounting and financial accounting needs, needs to work hand in hand. And I think also all the things that CIMA are proposing uh, with their global management accounting principles um, is for management accounting to help uh, make decisions that will help aid financial accounting uh, going forward. Musa, uh, you've been a management accountant. Yeah. Uh, what's your experience of this? Uh, it sounds as if the two disciplines don't always talk to each other yeah. or perhaps don't even uh, take uh, acknowledge each other's existence properly. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. In my experience, uh, especially with the company where I am now, is the external or orientation, especially with dealing with land. Uh, government has got a lot of, of interest when it comes to, it, to land use. Mm. We identified two risks, political risk and social risk. And so as a business, we said, how can we use a tool of management accounting to make sure that, one, we're not only just mitigating that risk, mm. we create value for those two stakeholders. Give me an example. You know, Tonga Artunid is a company that is notionally a sugar company, yes. but they happen to have the good luck to have all this land on yes, the coast yes, of KwaZulu-Natal. Yes. Exactly. And they're also a land company in effect. Exactly. So give me an example from that world of how a management accountant would add the value to the company. Okay. Take like the Etiguini municipality where all those land holdings uh, are most of it. What we have done there, land was coming under pressure as a result of the town or the city growing northwards towards the new airport. And as a result of that, the city, what it did was to proclaim that as a township from a spatial planning point of view. And 80% of that land is owned and controlled by Tonga Tulet. And then we had to come together with the Tiguini municipality to say, here is a land asset. How can we make sure that the highest and best value and the value extraction that mm. happens benefit both stakeholders? Government, in terms of housing, integrated human settlement, we had to sit together and say, these uh, 8,500 hectares, how can we make sure that from a product mm. development perspective, we develop products that speaks to mm. the demands. It sounds also different. like yes. uh, the financial accountant would say, sell the land, let's see what we can get for it. Yeah. Management accountant uh, would say, no, no, there's, there's other value issues. Exactly. Yeah. There are other stakeholders. Mm. It's not only shareholders. There mm. are communities, mm. there's government, mm. and there are other land uses. For instance, I think there is environmental <coughs> impact to our land. We need to also take cognizance of the, the the, the buffers, for instance, how do you make use of those buffers such that people don't encroach on them, they use them effectively for the benefit of the community. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's stop the thing there. I think we're getting a picture now of the usefulness, but now let's get back to the problem. Now, what is this document that you've put out? What is it setting out that is, uh, if you like, the solution? In what way is it a solution to the problem of different companies doing different things, not speaking the same language in management accounting? Okay. <clears throat> First of all, it, what it tries to do really is to uh, provide a basis for which the conversation would have to take place. So we, we rightly call it principles because principles should form the basis of action. Yeah. And, and so what is the foundation uh, on which management accounting will be based. So, so that's the first thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And the second thing then is to stake out uh, those principles. So we stake out three principles. Uh, and then we do two other things with the uh, three principles. First of all, we apply them to a performance management framework, which is what most organizations would Well, use. before we get to that, let's talk about the principles. Okay. And I'll just list the three of them. And perhaps you can all come in on, on the, the importance of them. Preparing relevant information, that sounds obvious, but yeah. clearly it's not obvious, otherwise you wouldn't have said it's a principle. Modeling value creation, secondly, yeah. and communicating with impact, thirdly. Yeah. Talking about preparing relevant information, if I could again use the term, what's the problem? 
with, uh, at the moment with uh, information not being relevant, Kevin? Um, yeah, and for, for information to be relevant, I think what we need to do is we need to take that data that we've got uh, within our organizations and we basically need to assimilate it so that we can make decisions on it and, and then obviously communicate that. So I think that's where all of this comes back and, and links back to the definition of, of management accounting. Uh, and an another thing, if I may just uh, add uh, to it, in accounting we have been very uh, comfortable with three types of information. Information about our internal operations, which we report externally. Uh, we are quite uh, okay with it. past information, and we are very okay with financial information. The way in which the world has moved now, that is not enough to run an organization. So for you to be able to bring in relevant information, take the time dimension, for example. You move, need to move beyond the past to the present and the future. What I say is that the past gives you hindsight. The present gives you insight. The uh, future information gives you foresight. And you've got to be able to do that. Number two uh, is that if you want to look at the drivers of, of change within an organization, it's both internal drivers and external drivers. So what is happening externally and how it impacts the organization creates opportunities, creates risk, and things like that are quite important for So we need to bring that information that is relevant. And finally, we talk about we are experts of financial information. And what we're saying is that, look, relevant information is not only financial information. So you need to extend it to non-financial information. Non-financial information will break <coughs> into two parts. What we call quantitative non-financial information, so numbers, and non-quantitative qualitative financial information. If you don't mind my saying so, David, for example, uh, I look at uh, yeah, your, your, your demeanor and presentation, and that is fantastic. But it's, it's qualitative. Is non uh, it, it's not quantitative, it's, it's, it's not financial. I can tell but you how much the suit costs. Uh, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, and, and yet you can track the, the qualitative back to uh, the, the quantitative and then to the financial. Mm. And we need to have a smooth flow from what is non-financial to what is financial, what is external to the internal, and the nexus and the connection between the two, what is past from what is present and the future and the link between the two. And finally, we are short-term experts. We need to look at the long term mm -hmm. and how do we track not the long term alone or the short term alone, but the connection between the long term and the short term. So that's, those are part of the mm. problems that we're dealing with. Musa, the second uh, principle, modeling value creation, modeling being the key word there, to yes. stimulate different scenarios that demonstrate the cause and effect relationships between inputs and outcomes. So you don't just sit passively, yep. you run scenarios, if this happens and that's the price and that's the effect on whatever. Yes. You, you, would you have done this at Tonga Hewlett? Yes, in our case, Dave, uh, we have both, if you take the systems theory, for instance, which looks at your input process output, the business have been very good at that in terms of how do we drive down cost? How do we bring in eff eff efficiencies mm -hmm. within the business? But we needed to ask ourselves for whose benefit? And that's when we move to outcomes and impact. That's why when it comes to communication and making sure that the value that we have created, it creates the impact, the desired impact mm -hmm. with government and the desired impact with communities. So for us, from the stakeholder relations perspective, we needed to make sure that the information, the stakeholder mapping, we have all the stakeholders that impact us negatively and positively, so that we can build a relationship with them, moving also beyond just building a relationship to engagement for yeah. value, to say, how can we work together? But modeling is part of the process of doing that, not just dreaming up. Yes. Kevin, um, it strikes me here that the, the practice in, in companies must vary considerably, and I think that's one of the things that comes out here. The language isn't the same, practices vary. Uh, in your sense, are there some companies that are doing very well? Uh, maybe you could give a couple of examples. Maybe you don't want to give the examples of ones that are doing, doing it badly, <laughs> but uh, are there South African companies that are world class at this kind of thing? Yeah, I'm sure they are. I mean, from an academic perspective, we're not always familiar with things that are happening in the, in the, in the real world. But uh, most definitely, I think there are companies that are, are leading the way. Um, 
using that, that uh, information that they've gotten from their management accounting systems, um, modeling it, creating value, mm -hmm. being innovative, I think in, in some regards, and, uh, and then communicating that also. The communication is the third principle, and I think yeah. this perhaps is where the devil really is in the detail. It's well, all very well to do things, yeah. but... If, if, even before that, and, and then mm. tying in with, with communication, uh, in terms of m uh, value creation, mm. the, the financial report on which the values of organizations are stated is what we know, now, we know as a balance sheet. Now, if you take st stocks listed on uh, the Johannesburg uh, Stock Exchange, for example, if you look at what their balance sheet says is their value, and you look at the, their value also on the stock exchange, you find out that the balance sheet accounts for only 20% of the value. So where is it, where is the rest of the value mm -hmm. being created? Mm -hmm. And if you only manage on the basis of the 20% of the value on the balance sheet, you're in trouble because you're leaving 80% of your value creation activity to chance. So you've got to be able to model on that. Let me just give you one example of it, which uh, Musa alluded to. For example, we don't value relationships. Mm. But your relationship counts for something. This is again your qualitative <coughs> quantity. Exactly. It's hard <coughs> so so, so my relationship with my supplier, for example, the yeah. Japanese used it to good effect. So you got supply chain management flowing out of that, just in time delivery systems flowing out. Of that. What's my relationship with my customers? Yeah. So loyalty cards, et cetera, and things like that. Those are the drivers of value oh. <coughs> uh, for us. What's the relationship with the, with the community in which I live? Etc. So, so those are there. Now, how does now, that fit with management accounting? Well, that's what, that's that's the the thing with management accounting. We move from the financial to the non-financial, and we try to track the financial through to the non-financial, mm. yeah, uh, and then the non-financial through to the financial. Uh, and what it tries to do is to bring together dis disparate disciplines in organisations to talk to each other, because you see, you have marketing people who have what they'll see, see, some of it are quantitative, some of it are financial, most of it are not financial, most of it are non-quantitative. Mm -hmm. You have HR people, et cetera, and things like that. And you need to be able to see how their management of relationship, their management of human capital, et cetera, contribute towards the creation of value for an organization. Management accounting, if you like, provides the language and the integrative mechanism to do that, to uh, enable us to do that. That's how come the analysis is quite important. And what yeah. we want to do is to take accountants from analyzing uh, organizations according to departments, according to to sub companies, but to try to analyze according to value creation activities. Mm -hmm. So, what's your value chain? How do you create value? How do you take out uh, input and transform them into outputs? What are the key relationships that enables that? What are the technology dependencies, etc., and things like that? And begin to allocate cost and revenue and value to that. Then you see the kind of things that are not working, and you begin to home in on that and work with that. So, so, so that's in the uh, in terms of the modeling of value creation. Mm -hmm. So, people model. But we're saying that you've got to model a away from assets, liabilities, and things like that into value creation. When it comes to the communication, then you've got to have a creative way of communicating. Well, so let's, let's get to communication in a moment. Just on that modeling, I want to come back to uh, Musa. Yeah. Do you find inside the organization, uh, maybe it's linked to communication, but uh, you, you've got to have a champion for this kind of approach. Yes. If there isn't the right person pushing it, uh, yeah. you're going to have the financial accountants dominating everything exactly. uh, and certain things not happening. Yes. In our organization, I think strategic influencing is very, very important. You've got to, the buy-in for value creation sits right at the top. Because if it's not happening there, if you're not influencing at that level, the whole organization, I mean, is, is, is being challenged. Yeah. So as a management accountant, you are like a conscience of the team. You are in a position because of our training in terms of your business strategy, your financial strategy, in terms of how you understand IT, the whole value chain analysis, you are in a position to make some determination using sci the management accounting science to say, these kind of activities are going to create value for stake. What is it that we need to do effectively and what is it that we need to stop doing? Because again, it's so easy, I mean, for your management team to keep on doing one and the same thing and, and hope for different results. So, but in our case, we make sure that our structure is so flat that 
the CEO is part and parcel of those conversations so that he can understand what is yeah. happening. Well, what the do they ground, say? Yes. Doing the same thing over and over again and <coughs> expecting something different to happen is uh, one definition of madness. <laughs> I, I, I'm also reminded of, uh, as, a, as a journalist and editor, often saying to journalists in the financial field, uh, at Financial Mail, for example, saying the numbers, now we're talking financial accounting, the numbers are the result of what people have done. Yeah. What was it that those people have done and what are they doing now yeah. in order to create the next set of numbers? And I'm, I'm just realising that this is what's talking to management accounting exactly. as opposed to that uh, rear view mirror. Yeah. Well, we're going to get to the communication aspect of this, which uh, could be the most crucial part of it, but uh, a short commercial break now. Stay tuned to CNBC Africa. Well, welcome back to the SEMA Dialogue Series. Today we're unpacking the newly drafted set of global management accounting principles. Joining our, our panel of guests here again, uh, Noel Tagger, who's uh, Executive Director of the SEMA Education uh, Area. Noel, let's just talk about that communication aspect. It seems to me all that you've said, good common sense stuff, it makes sense, how it can enhance an organisation. If it's not communicated internally, and in that sense, where you persuade people that this is important, it's not going to be much use. Yes, exactly. And so, uh, in terms of communication, there are a couple of things you need to think about. The language in which you communicate is one. Uh, you don't assume that everybody uh, has a love for numbers, for example. Um, when I was uh, a young accountant with BP, uh, we communicated simply by spreadsheets uh, and numbers. And if you didn't understand, we thought you were an idiot. Okay. <coughs> but later on, we found out when I moved out of accounting into strategy, I found out that the accounting numbers never spoke to strategy at all. Uh, so different types of people want to be spoken to differently. And it's the same message. And if you've got to influence people, you've got to do that. The second thing about communication is the timeliness of the communication. Because don't give me information that I cannot act upon. Give me information that I can act upon uh, is one. And then you've got to also look at the person that you are sending it to. So in terms of the quantity of information that you give, it's quite important that you, 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 you send it to the right kind of uh, people. If I just use an airline analogy, mm -hmm. for example, on an Airbus uh, uh, plane, you get about 3,900 pieces of information coming to you straight as a pilot and a co-pilot. Oh, right. What they tend to do is they split the information into three areas. One to engine makers, another to maintenance team, and about 460 of them, or, or no, 390 of them probably, come to uh, the uh, pilots. And what comes to the pilot, only a, a small fraction of, of those they use actively. And at any particular point in time, they use only six pieces of information. So from 3,900 pieces of information to six pieces of information to fly a plane at any particular point in time. Mm -hmm. That then shows us how to, you can get so much information, but you can split it and direct it to the people who need the information. So if you're talking to top management, summarize from straight to the point. If you're talking to the guy on the shop floor, local issue that affects him, that affects his behavior. Those are the kind of things that we are drawing people's attention. So that is now credibility too, because uh, yes, uh, like anyone in an organization, whether it's the HR department or the accounting department or whatever, you, you've got to get your credibility with the other people in exactly. uh, the yes. company. And if yeah. you don't have credibility, they won't pay any attention That's to you. It. Musa, uh, let's talk politics inside a company. I mean, yes. can, uh, in your experience, can a managing accountant become the financial director? Um, if he were to play his cards right, be credible, communicate properly, yes. he could become a dominant player? Yes. Could he become the CEO? Or is it regarded as a kind of separate <coughs> career path? You're not actually going to get to those heights in the company. In my organization, the ethos that drives everyone who is there is you're not competing against anyone, you're competing against yourself. And you know what the strategies are, you know what to influence, and be the best that you can be. And but will you get to the top if you're the best of, you can? Of course, of yeah. course. Uh, uh, the issue is we, we might find a situation like in our organization where only 5% of the team is management accountants. But guess what? There's 95% influence in terms of delivery. You make sure that 
in a, 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 in a strategic team, you engage them on the principles that sometimes they take so lightly. Budgeting, you start using the platform of budgeting as a tool mm. to drive them to say, it's not only about budgeting. So it sounds like you're saying impact. it's up to the individual and the company, yes. uh, obviously, to interact with each other. Hey, Kevin? Can I give yeah. some example of that? For example, CU, uh, we have former CEO of Diageo, Paul Walsh, started as a, as a management accountant, mm. Diageo globally. Current CEO of uh, Shell, Simon Henry, started out, in fact he started out as an engineer, moved into management accounting, mm. and he's the CFO of uh, Shell. And if you look at Shell, I mean the amount of money that flows into Shell and things like that, mm. you need people like that who can be co-navigators yeah. with uh, and co-pilots with CEOs to, in order to uh, ensure that mm. uh, the financial insight that comes from uh, uh, the analysis is communicated so that it influences the organization. So it sounds can be a very powerful position yes. if uh, the person is playing it right, communicating yeah. right, observing these principles that you're talking about. Kevin, the teaching of, of management accounting, my image of accountants at university were they were the ones that didn't get breaks. They just yeah. worked all day and after day they played pinball as it was then. Now I suppose it would be Xbox and things like that. We used to get a break occasionally. Yeah. What they were teaching in my impression was this very long chartered accountancy course, basically. Uh, what's different about what you teach? What's the same compared to the financial accountants? Sure. If we maybe look at uh, SEMA's core practice areas that they've proposed in the document, they, they talk about 12 core practice areas and uh, only a couple of those touch on financial accounting. So things like external reporting and maybe things about regulations and uh, tax management and so on. But uh, management accounting covers a much broader area than that and I'm pleased to say that looking at that we basically teach all of those 12 core practice areas. But it also includes things like budgeting, investment appraisal, uh, project management which I want to maybe just emphasize that most um, financial accounting courses wouldn't really focus on project management yeah. because it's maybe something that's outside um, of the finance function. Would it be comparable to you know, like theoretical physics as opposed to actually running a power station? Uh, the theory and practice, much more practice? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think it's more practical but also more business related, uh, focusing on the heart of the business yeah. Yeah. and stuff. And I think that's the, th the thing about the project management is that within any organization there are many projects running at the same time and different kinds of projects and that. And the management accountant needs to be able to get involved in those in his role as the management oh. accountant but to, to you make sure that deadlines are met, that we come in within budget oh. and, and so on. So I think, like I said, the, the 12 practice uh, areas that, that SEM is proposing is, is very important for management accountants and I think that's the key differences between financial and management accounting from a, a teaching perspective. Yeah. When you come out at the end, is there a, a, a B man ACK qualification or isn't there a differentiation when it comes to the piece of paper you get? Yeah. Look, uh, for our students, they would study a, a BCom Finance or a BCom oh. Accounting at the undergrad and then we have one honours program that really is aligned to SEMA and, and that's our BCom Honours Financial Management. So at the end of that, our students would get uh, exemptions from SEMA because the university has accreditation mm. and to, to ensure that we get the, that accreditation is, is to make sure that we uh, let's say map to the SEMA s syllabus mm. and, and like I said uh, we do that and, and that's why our students will, will cover all those uh, core practice areas in the syllabus. Are there a couple more examples of these it's, kinds it's, of areas? Uh, well uh, what I say if I draw us back to the construct of it we say in SEMA that there are four main uh, competences that you have and all of those competences must be underpinned by professionalism, integrity and ethics, which is very important. And the aim of that is to produce competent and confident uh, management account, uh, finance professionals. Competent because you need the people to be able to do what you've studied. Confident because if you have a competent person and the person is not confident, the person will stay within yeah. his or her box and will not innovate. Mm. And given the fast pace of change in knowledge, the person will become outdated very soon. However, if you have a confident person who is not competent, we say, God help us mm. in terms of that. But if I move to the competencies, we have what we call technical accounting and finance competencies, which we share most of them with uh, uh, the financial report and the CAs and others. And then, <coughs> so that's the first 
one. The second is what we call business acumen, where we need a person to be able to understand the context, the external, internal environment within which their organization is taking place, the political pressures, the other pressures over there, and things like that. So that's there. The third set of competences, what we call people skills, where you are then using the insights from the first two to, to communicate, learn how to communicate to different types of people so that they engage with the organization in terms that is favorable to the organization. And then the fourth one is leadership skills, where you are leading in strategy, you are also leading the finance function itself, and then you are leading your peers to understand the financial implications of what happens. Once you've got all of these things in place, then you're ready to become a competent and confident finance professional. If I can maybe just add, and, and that's really where the, the, the basis of SEMA's let's say, revised syllabus that will be released in 2015 is those exactly. four professional competencies yes. uh, that Noel mentioned. Go now to our, uh, our audience uh, to ask them to start participating. And our audience in the studio with us is uh, been listening to the discussion, sitting quietly, um, and the camera can now, and the microphone can now go to our audience. Uh, and yes, if you'd just like to stand up and uh, identify yourself and uh, put your question to the panel or your comment. My name is uh, Robert Opini. I work for the National Energy Regulator and I'm um, uh, FCMA. The question I want to pose is uh, a comparative one. Um, if you look at the chartered accountants, they really uh, specialize on uh, IFRS, International Accounting Standards, and it it's therefore tends to be rule-based. Uh, what we're trying to do with these principles, I hope, doesn't convert our accountants from the innovative people that they are to be focusing on these principles as, as uh, rules like uh, the IFRS. So what are we going to do to ensure that we make them understand uh, as they come out that these are principles of, of best practice rather than rules like the IFRS? I, th I think the first uh, is in the name that we've mm -hmm. given it. So uh, we've avoided the temptation of calling it standards and we've called it principles, and it is what it is. And you find from the document that it is really very, uh, it's, it's not as tightly structured as rules uh, will be uh, tightly structured. So that is where we are, and uh, we will be producing diagnostic tools that people would use in order to assess where they are, and it gives a lot of flexibility. And one of the key things that we talk about uh, in terms of this document and the diagnostics tool is context, the importance of context, your context. So you, 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 you might simulate some things, emulate some things, and then you, you might adapt you know, some things. Maybe I can just add, I think really for, for me the, the key objective here is, 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 is best practice and also benchmarking. Yeah. So I don't think that uh, it's going to become something rules-based or, or standards or prescriptive in, in nature. I don't think that's the, the, the aim of the objective, but rather to, to share best practices within the field of management accounting so that companies uh, can learn and I think uh, improve their decision making yeah. going forward. I suppose the danger is if you start creating little boxes then people are going to feel they have to tick them uh, yeah. and then they stop uh, perhaps thinking and they stop doing other things so perhaps that's the danger not to yeah. systematize it too much exactly yeah. uh, which is the risk that uh, I think uh, global reporting has, has fallen yeah. uh, the, the, the danger is that global reporting has become too much of uh, uh, box ticking and not enough and uh, creativity. And you may also, sorry David, uh, restrict innovation. Yep. I think Excellent. that's yeah. another key thing within the area of management accounting is that oh. we're looking at innovation, forward focus, oh. driving the business and creating yeah. value. Unless you put a, a box which says innovation, then they'll tick it. <laughs> 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 another comment from the audience. Uh, Dennis McCarthy, also a Chartered Management Accountant. Um, management accounting requirements differ across uh, companies and also differ uh, among similar companies with different strategies. Um, do you think that the adoption of these principles will actually improve the level of management accounting uh, throughout industry? And secondly, how will I as a CEO uh, know that these principles are actually being applied in my organization with the information that's required to me? Uh, and just as a very quick comment, um, uh, industrial development is a very high priority in this country. And although there are some pockets of excellence, I believe the, the poor level of management accounting throughout the South African industry is in fact holding back industrial development. And the adoption of these principles will be a, will be a huge improvement and a, an opportunity to drive that industrial development. Thank you. Perhaps now I'll start again. And for me, the most important part of that question was how, how will we know 
that it's happening. Perhaps that well, was well, the heart uh, of it. Part of it is creating awareness across the globe that something like this exists so that uh, chief executives can then begin to demand uh, com uh, not compliance, but uh, whether or not it is being followed. Uh, and we're having good traction with that globally across our engagement with chief executives and uh, other people like that. And uh, within the Western world, particularly, we have uh, regulatory uh, authorities, etc., weighing in and saying that this is something that we should they, they sh should promote. So we are promoting that. So so that that's that's the first uh, thing. Uh, but what we do is simply to say to chief executives and, and others that, is your finance function working for you? Is it a strange land? Are they speaking a language you don't understand? Are they saying things that do not resonate with your practical experience? Because as you said, the numbers ha should have a story behind that. The yeah. credibility of finance is whether the story behind that accords with the daily life experience of people. Mm. So that is there. And if I might just say uh, something slightly about uh, the, the differences. If you look at the language we're using, we're saying, for example, with information, we're not telling you what type of information you should put. We're just saying relevant information. So you've got to determine what information is relevant to you. When we talk about the second principle of modeling value creation, we do not say to you what you should do. We're saying, look at your strategy. Look at your environment. What is it yeah. where your value creation is? If you look at one of the diagrams we have talked about that within the context of business models, everyone has different business models. So look at your business models and align that. So all we're saying to you is that you, know, you might come in as a, a size, uh, uh, a huge person, so you wear a huge suit. Fine. Make sure that it fits. Yeah. You might come in as a, a, a slimmer person. Fine. Doesn't matter. Make sure it fits. Yeah. You might come uh, be operating in the social sector and your key stakeholders are probably environmentalists and they hold the key to your survival and uh, uh, your success. Talk to them in a language yeah. that they will. Yeah. Or you might find out that shareholders in that particular cycle of creating value or seeking funds are the most important. Find a language to speak to them. So we leave it to your ingenuity and, and what all we are doing is supplying examples in various industries of how people have done it in the past as guidelines. guidance. Yeah. And so the US uses principles, relevant guidance, and things like that. And yeah. we would we'll stress it. Mr. Yeah. Comente? Yes. Uh, in our organization also, it's very important. It was very important that we look at it in context, as Noel has just said. Partnering with your internal stakeholders is very important, with your human resources, to ask how Yes, but how can we do this thing? So strategic influencing, therefore, becomes a very important aspect to this because skills talks about what to do. But the how part is the differentiating competencies where you hold people accountable. It very sounds also important. Politically, yeah. internally, yes. uh, if you come with solutions, and from yeah. the sounds of it, with the training and the attitude that management accountants have, they can come with solutions, yeah. then you get uh, credibility. credibility. Another yeah. comment or question from the audience? Question. Yes. Yes, uh, morning. My name is Bright Amisit from the SABS. Two questions. One for Kevin. Kevin, um, do you foresee changes in our um, teaching of management accounting will take place uh, based on the principles? Uh, that's my first question. The second one is to know. Um, I, I think for principles like this to get traction, they must be solving a, uh, you know, a real need. There must be a need in the, I'm speaking here in terms of you know, thinking of two sectors in particular. Uh, if I look at the public sector and the charity sector, where if you look globally today, we don't have harmonized um, standards for the charity sector. And most of, if you look at IFRS or the, the SME version, is very, it doesn't speak to that sector. But what happens in charity and what happens in, in um, uh, the public sector is essentially management accounting. And in the context of the Pani declaration on aid effectiveness, there's been that drive to strengthen uh, public finance management in, 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 in developing countries, which is an African uh, uh, imperative, really. How is SEMA planning to embed the, because it's just a codification of practice, but how, how do you intend to move them forward? 
you know, to solve the real needs of the continent. Thank you. Actually, that's something that hasn't come up uh, yet at all, is the public sector and the private sector. Um, I remember <coughs> chairing a, a conference where they were talking about auditors, internal auditors, external auditors, and how the internal auditors in government have rather different roles to the internal auditors uh, in the private sector. But Kevin, the, the question first, the changes as a result of this campaign development um, in the teaching? I, the things that uh, SEMA have come up with are not new things. So I, I don't see a major change in the way management accounting will be taught because like I mentioned earlier, many of these core practices we already address and cover in the syllabus and, and it's in the, the current SEMA syllabus. So yes, possibly some uh, minor refinements in terms of how, how we would do that. But I, again, I see the benefit here is more for the the, how, how it will happen in practice and it maybe also comes to, to answering Dennis's question uh, a bit earlier about what happens uh, within organizations when they do things differently and I think that's probably if I can say been the problem with management accounting is that up until now every company does what they want how they want it and there hasn't been this best practice or benchmarking so I think what this will offer is, is from a practical point of view the opportunity to benchmark do best practice and possibly improve your, your management accounting information that you prepare, financial as well as non-financial, so that you can uh, make better decisions than what you're currently doing and, and hopefully again that will lead to innovation and, and wealth creation with, within the organisation. So I don't see major uh, changes but maybe some refinements and maybe what we can also do is bring in the best practices into the classroom and the teaching uh, of students and, and maybe looking at examples where companies are uh, doing best practice and, and so forth. Yeah. Noel, uh, perhaps you'd like to look at the public sector it charity uh, <coughs> illustration. It's, it's <coughs> one of the things we're doing is uh, developing a, a slight public sector variant of this. And so we're talking to different public sector organizations uh, within South Africa, in Malaysia, for example, and in the Western world about something like that. And we have uh, a mini conference taking place uh, in June, sometime in June, to address the public sector specific issues. But part of what we know is that the word value, which is central to what we're doing. Yeah. How do you create value? How do you preserve value? How do you distribute value is core. And that transcends sectors. So, and who you create the value for is quite important. Uh, so with charities, for example, uh, you have different way, uh, people that you create the value for. So you are not looking for a financial end. You are looking for an outcome based on an intervention, so uh, a better society, a more healthy society, a more educated society, or, or whatever it is uh, that it is. So you, what we're saying is that the, the information that you're presenting, you've got to flip it around. Yeah. So relevant information is not financial information. If I'm sick and dying, I don't care about that. I care about doctors, I care about hospital beds and things like that. I care about <coughs> at the rates, <coughs> uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, mortality rates, mm -hmm. etc. I care about uh, students' progression. Still have to be concerned about the money, though. Well, yeah. you, you, you got, but then the money be, doesn't become an outcome; it becomes mm. an input into the process. Mm. Yeah. Whereas, if you take a purely commercial organisation, the money is both an input and an outcome of the process. Well, I'm going to stop you there just to take one more question from the audience. Indeed, if there is one, yes, there is. Morning um, to the panelists, Rory Sanglibete, Associate Chartered Man Management Accountant. Um, I'd just like to steal on the comments that Noel made. Um, in terms of drivers within the value chain, stakeholder communication, um, as well as decision making, I just think that you know there's, there's value in removing the jargon from management accounting principles vis-a-vis um, -vis what you see in financial accounting principles like IFRS people within the organization who are really key to, to driving the value are often removed from those financial accounting principles because it's jargon to them. So I, I do believe that there is value in SEMA ensuring that these global management accounting principles are really understood and are driven down to where the drivers actually sit and where the decision makers actually sit. So to make sure that um, 
the, the people sitting in your HR, in your marketing, in your supply chain, have a full understanding of um, these principles in order for them to understand their past, present, and future, and how the, the, they drive the decisions in the organization. And perhaps a follow-on question to that is, um, so in, in, in making sure that these principles are embedded in the organization, how does SEMA plan to do that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Noel to answer that as we're running a bit out of time. If you could answer that, and we'll take closing comments from okay. the panel. Well, uh, mainly... So it's plain English that we're talking yeah, about, exactly. or plain whatever language we're well, talking about. Well, plain English, but also, also tapping it into uh, conversations with various professional bodies. So for the moment, at the moment, uh, the Chartered Institute of uh, Personnel and Development, those who deal with HR, are working with us to develop HR metrics on talent, Etc. and things like that, the value of talent. So they are bringing soft side, we are bringing hard side, and we are finding a middle ground. But are you kept, are you watching the jargon? So that uh, exactly. So so it is it is only when you start talking to somebody else, then you realize that the person doesn't understand your jargon. So so what what essentially we're trying to do is introduce accounting as conversation yeah. with different types of people. Once you start conversing you find out that you don't know the vocabulary of each other and you begin to learn the vocabulary of each other. Yeah. And these things cannot be legislated. It's going yeah. to be a hard slog, but we've got to do it. So we're engaging with the marketers, we're engaging with uh, engineers, we're engaging with lawyers and other groups of people to open up the conversations and bring us into their language. Maybe the final comment from you, Musa, is uh, how you think that conversation has worked for you in Tonga Hewlett? In our case, Partnering for value is very, very important. Um, as I've said, that the two main stakeholders that we are dealing with is communities and government. We are busy with a, a, a project here where we're saying, how do we create empowered, engaged, and effective communities? I think my fellow uh, member there has, spoke about, has spoken about the, the charity side of it. In South Africa, charities are very, they are a bit challenged in terms of playing their role yeah. and making sure that they become spokespersons of communities out there. So as Tom and Hewlett, we're taking it upon ourselves to say, in order for us to be a strong company, we need very strong communities, otherwise you're going to have another and kind implicit of... implicit there is yeah. the conversation has got to be good. Very Kevin, important. final word from you. I'll just say that uh, maybe my hope with something like this also is to attract more students, more people into the profession of management accounting um, because every organization needs management accountants and uh, to drive value, create value within organizations as a university we would be looking to train right. management accountants. Noel, just to finish off our first uh, program uh, in the SEMA Dialogue series, uh, what happens now? Um, wh what is the process? You've got this document out there for discussion. So we've got this document out there for uh, discussion. Uh, we close off consultation on the 10th of May and then we will uh, start analyzing responses and, and then we will uh, publish a final version uh, of uh, the principles in September and we'll still keep engaging with people and asking when situations change, update them. But the most important, one of the most important things we do is to provide tools, a diagnostic tool out of that. And we're talking to the accounting community uh, uh, at large, including the major audit firms on how to uh, create a diagnostic tool like that to help management accountants. Well, and I've got lots more questions. One of them is, um, what's the difference between a managing director and a management accountant? Because it sounds as if a management accountant is doing a lot of the big picture things uh, that a managing director could do. So uh, I think that's an, a new light on, on what is clearly a very interesting field. It's not the end of the process, but it's the end of the first episode in the SEMA Dialogue series. So thank you to my guests, Noel Tago, uh, Musa Shabani and Kevin Thomas. And thanks to our audience as well here in the studio at CNBC Africa. Until next time, it's goodbye and thanks for joining us.